Good afternoon. Today is June 21st, 2005. We are at the home of Mr. Ken Killalay in Hampstead, New Hampshire. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon. Let's start out, Ken. Uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you were born and your date of birth. Well, I was born in Haverhill, uh, April 24th, 1922, and uh, grew up in Haverhill, basically, and uh, moved around a little bit because I went out to visit my dad and uh, my folks were divorced, so I spent time with my dad and spent time with my, uh, my mother here in Havel. How many, uh, did you have any siblings? Yes, I had uh, one uh, older sister and I had two stepsisters. Yeah. Okay. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you were doing prior to entering the service. Well, I was a playboy. I was doing absolutely nothing. My uh, dad was fortunate enough to be able to give me an allowance and a car, and uh, most of my friends had allowances and a car, and I was living in Wellesley, Mass. at the time, and uh, I never even mowed along. When did you uh, when did you enter the service? I signed up December eighth, the day after Pearl Harbor, uh, in nineteen forty one. And uh, a group of us from Wellesley went down in, in the Boston and signed up. Do you remember uh, where you were and what you were thinking when you heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Yes, I, I was uh, down near the WEEI uh, radio station, and I think it's in Somerville. And we were heading back from Havel to Wellesley when, when I heard it, uh, about it. And as soon as I get back to Wellesley, I called up. Peter Dunn, he also joined the Marine Corps, a group of our friends, and uh, said, look, uh, they're going to need us. Uh, what prompted you to join the Marines? As, as in <coughs> well, I, I, I knew a little about the Marine Corps. Not, not, I didn't study it, but I, I had understood about the Marine Corps. And I, I had a friend that uh, was in the Marine Corps peacetime. And uh, I was pretty thin, and uh, I didn't think I'd look too good in a sailor suit. And uh, and then I didn't like the army, army uh, khaki. And I pictured myself in those marine blues. I thought I looked pretty sharp, and that and that was a big factor. Plus, uh, I knew that the Marine Corps were, were warriors. They had a tremendous history going back as far as 1775. And uh, all a proud, proud uh, company of uh, men. So that was another factor in my decision. Well, three or four things you thought of before going in. Yeah. And you had a bunch of. You said you had a bunch of buddies that joined at the Six same. Six other. Yeah. How did that all come together? They all. Uh, they all got in. We never saw each other again, uh, with the exception of one. I, I, uh, sweet Cleveland from Wellesley. I saw him on Maui. He became an officer, and uh, I saw him. We were marching in two different directions, and I recognized him, and I hollered out, Hey, Swede! And he stopped his platoon, and uh, we got talking, and we uh, made arrangements to meet together at the officers' club, and have a few beers, and he, uh, he unfortunately got killed in a jeep accident on Maui. Uh, Peter Dunn, one of my real close friends, I've never, I've seen him after I got out of the service, but I've lost contact with him over the years. And you get home, you get anxious to get married and raise a family, and you want all that put aside and try to forget it. Yeah. Yeah. How long between the, the time you enlisted before you shipped off to, to boot camp? Oh, it was quite a while because uh, I was, as I said, I was underweight and uh, I signed up in the Corps and they said to protect me from the draft. They would protect me from the draft if I could uh, put on some uh, weight and put an uh, inch on my chest expansion. And, and uh, so I, I moved into a YMCA and, and uh, worked out, made a lot of bananas, and <laughs> finally get in. Uh, so when did you ship off then for boot camp? Uh, in September 28th. And, of 42? Uh, 42, yeah. Do you remember the day you left? Uh, were family there to see you off, friends? No, uh, not really. I was, as I say, I was living in Worcester at a, at a, 
at a YMCA that specialized in, uh, in building uh, a muscle men out of weaklings. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I went in, I, I rode in the bus with a, a chap named uh, Jerry Lemerys from Cherry Valley uh, in, in Worcester area and a few other fellows I don't remember that well but we went in and we uh, got into Boston and they uh, got us all uh, ready and they put us on a train for PI. Yeah. Uh, Paris Island? Yeah. And tell us a little bit about uh, what well, that was that, like. That was a shock. Uh, well, we got off the, we went by train to Yamasee and then we got off and, and we got a, a, a bus over to PI. And we all got outside the bus mm -hmm. and uh, this D.I. Yukomsky, I'll never forget him, he, uh, he just took us as a bunch of human flesh and hair and he got us right down to a pile of clay, just a pile of clay. And he said, and I can't repeat what I'm going to do to you people to make Marines out of you. And he called us everything in the book and uh, the, the lowest forms of humanity that you could possibly think of. And uh, he said, uh, I just want you to remember one thing. He said, I want each and every one of you to pray for your soul. He says, because your ass belongs to the core. And he meant every word of it. So we went through the training and humiliation and <laughs> what have you. And he, you know, he was right. He molded us in the Marines out of that pile of clay. When you look back on that experience, how do you how do you see that? Was that a uh, well? You look that... back at it uh, with humor now, but you look back at it with horror when you first got out of there. You just hated him, <laughs> hated everything he stood for, and, and uh, but you realize that it had to be done. And then when you got signed to your company and uh, the Fleet Marine Force, and you realize you were you were one unit. And uh, it was, you know, you realize it was worth going through. Do you look back on him now with admiration, or do you still? Uh, still don't like him. Still don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where he is. I just didn't think he could, he had to be that mean, you know. I, I had nice blonde duck uh, ass haircut, and uh, you know, he made me bald headed and humiliated. <laughs> And I just didn't think he had to be that mean, but he did. He had to be. Yeah. Okay. So at, at, at basic training, that's when you formed in your, into your company, or? After, after Paris Island, we were shipped to the Fleet Marine Force in New River, North Carolina. And that was the 3rd Division. We were assigned to the 3rd Division. And uh, when we got there, of course, we weren't treated like, you know, the lowest forms of humanity then. We were treated as Marines. And uh, so that was a comforting feeling to, to have that off our back. And I, uh, I can remember what they told us there, though, that uh, was quite leveling. They said that uh, we were going through a re rigorous Marine Corps combat training. Uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, as, as tough a training as you can possibly imagine, because we're getting you ready. We're, we won't be long in the States. Uh, and uh, so 70% uh, of you will be killed between Paris Island and Tokyo. It's a long, long way. So 70% of you will probably get killed, never return. But 30% of you will. And he said the 30% that pays a lot of attention to training and works hard at their training. It's no guarantee, but it might help you wind up in that 30%. Oh. So everybody looked around to the next guy, you poor bastard. <laughs> You're not going to make it, but I am. That sort of thing. You know, survive with the fittest. And uh, then we went through the training and it was very rigorous. And uh, I, I was a machine gun, became a machine gunner. One of the reasons I became a machine gunner, uh, they ask you what you do in civilian life like you just asked me. 
And they'd say, I'm a, I was a truck driver, and they'd say, well, you're going to Cooks and Baker's school. And, well, you, oh, I was a baker, you're going to motor transport. So I got, I got in there and I figured, no more Sergeant Yukomsky, so I said, uh, he said, well, you young man, I said, I was a playboy. He said, heavy weapons. <laughs> so after that, I finally realized the best thing to do in this corps was keep your mouth shut. <laughs> but uh, then uh, we get split right in half, your division. Now, have you all traveled as a group from basic training to the next? No, we just was. After basic training, you went out, we're all split? Right, every, you went every different direction. Okay. Uh, the only one that, as that mentioned, that young boy, Le Maurice, he was in my, we went together. Let's say probably, probably a half a dozen of us went to, to the 2nd Battalion, some went to the 1st Battalion, some went to the regimental headquarters. You just, they just scattered you around like, uh, <coughs> for, I, I don't know the reason, but they didn't keep us as a unit naturally. And uh, so I had signed up for paratroopers. I had seen the paratroopers there, they ran to Chow, they ran to Mail Call, they ran to the movies, they, they just uh, cadence all the time singing and they were jumping out of planes and they were having a wonderful time. So I signed up for the paratroopers. And uh, as I say, they split the division, all leaves, all transfers, everything was canceled. And they just, I don't know how they did it, but my whole company, you're going you're going to the 4th Marine Division. So they must have split the battalions down the middle because all the companies seem to remain the same. So they split us down the middle and they said, you're all going to Camp Pendleton in uh, California for your further training and you will be part of the new 4th Division, the Fighting 4th. Everybody else is staying in North, in North Carolina and will remain there in training, fill up with new recruits from Paris Island and everywhere, and formed the 3rd Division. Now, Captain William Glynn, who was one of the uh, uh, Annapolis boys from Havel in the Marine Corps, he was in the 3rd Division. He got killed on Guam. So we got on a troop train and off we went to Camp Pendleton, and we filled up with all West Coast, uh, West Coast boys until we got the 4th Division. And then uh, we were the first division that was that ever left the United States and went right into combat. All all other Marines went to, to Samoa or, or Australia or New Zealand or somewhere and train did more training in, in uh, jungle warfare and whatever. But we went right to the to the Marshall Islands and were in the war and for our first campaign. And uh, that was. Uh, that was quite interesting and, and exciting. <clears throat> you know, the first time in combat, it was, uh, you didn't know what to expect. You weren't frightened, it was just a lot of anticipation. So my machine gun sections, and my group, we cut our belts in half. You know, they were in a box, they'd come out and feed the machine gun. We cut them in half, we put on, I put on an asbestos mitten that you change the barrel in a firefight if you lose your landing grooves. <laughs> and uh, we landed firing from the hip, John Wayne style. So we just got in about 20 yards and fired from the hip and all of a sudden those jackasses on show were firing back at us. We said, holy crap, this isn't Camp Pendleton. <laughs> we hit the deck. And then the bombs started going off, and the hand grenades started going off, and firing of all. Everybody was firing, and uh, it was quite, it was quite an awakening. But it was a good indoctrination to our first, first combat, because then we got to, you know, not just hear about it and, and simulate it, and uh, to actually be in it, and, and uh, somebody shooting at you. So simulated, and the, the practice training. But, it was nothing no comparison. Like it, nothing like it, because you, in the practice, you weren't, you weren't afraid, you weren't excited, you weren't, you know, it was training. But this, your adrenaline really started to pump you in, pump you in. And it, was, it was, to me, uh, looking back at it, uh, I was excited. It was really exciting. 
and uh, we had one of the biggest uh, bomb uh, go off on 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 Namur. They hit an ammunition dump and it went about 2,000 feet in the air, shook both islands. <coughs> Roy was here and the war was over to the side and um, we secured Roy fairly fast and so uh, my machine got out for the side where there was more action on the war so we went over there and fought on that one too. And uh, we, secured, we secured both the islands in pretty easy fashion. And then we went back to uh, Maui. That was our rest area. <coughs> we retrained, and, and uh, you know, then we all had combat experience. Our officers had combat experience. A lot of our officers, and uh, so then it was a whole different, a whole different psychology, as in your new, your new training for the next operation. Uh, not to be foolish. Not to do things like we did and uh, go in there because uh, it was pretty dangerous business. Yeah. yeah. What, uh, prior to shipping out, what did, uh, did you know about the Japanese? What did they tell you about the Japanese? What to expect about the enemy? Uh, had, uh... <clears throat> well, quite frankly, the only thing they knew about the Japanese were they were very cruel, brutal people, uh, and especially the, the, the military because of uh, stories in China, what they did in China. And we were told we were up against a very formidable uh, opponent, and he would uh, he would fight to his last breath. And uh, so we just took that as uh, the truth because we didn't know anything else. And it certainly turned out that way. They fought like that. They had maggots in their arms. They had uh, arms missing, and, and their, their last breath they'd detonate a hand grenade and throw it at you. Know, uh, a lie there, mortally wounded, but still alive. And when you pass through them, they shoot you. Uh, yeah, they were they were unbelievable tenacity as a fighter. I think the best in the world. Mm. Yeah. Of course, I I don't know, but in Europe, I mean, let's face it. In Germany, they they gave up in uh, in truckloads. In Italy, they gave up in treading loads. Uh, the Japanese just didn't give up. They just did not give up. And uh, <coughs> I never forget on Saipan, that was our, the next operation, it took 28 days to secure Saipan, but when we did secure it, they were jumping off the cliffs on the end of the island, and the, the natives and their children and a few Japanese stragglers. and. Uh, uh, the interpreters were there trying to convince them that, you know, we'd give them food, we'd give them water, we'd, they'd be well treated. Them. No way, they'd still jump off and dash themselves to, to death in the rocks. And they did capture a few. And they asked him, why? Why would you do that? And they said, well, they told us that for a Marine to get into the Marine Corps, he had to kill either his mother or his father. So imagine what he'll do to you. He'll cut you up in small pieces. He'll torture you and everything. So they figured a quick death was better than that. Mm. But uh, yeah, they had a, a, the Asian mindset is so different in our culture. Uh, I don't know any of us that would have done anything like that. Yeah. yeah. What, are, what are your feelings? Uh, do you still hold feelings against the Japanese to this day, or what happened? Well, I, I did for a long while. Uh, I, uh, I, you just can't have have somebody trying to kill you every minute of the day, and uh, you trying to kill them to survive, and knowing that uh, we didn't start this thing, they did. Uh, I, I just never could. I could never really forgive them. I really couldn't. Knowing the history from past, how they treated the, the Chinese and everything when they fought them, and, and in the Philippines and the Bataan Death March. H had you known about that uh, at that point? Oh, yeah, uh, had, so you were aware of the, oh, the Death yeah. March and such? That, that all became part of our training. We were indoctrinated in what, who we were up against. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I could. I could be social with them, like today, and if you had brought in two Japanese or three, 
I could sit here and be social with them, but I had a deep down feeling that, uh, that I could never, never really forgive them what they did. Yeah. Yeah. Because I had too many friends left over there. Yeah. Because just on Iwo Jima, we lost 7,000 men. Um, but I, I know life goes on and uh, you just can't. Uh, but I, I, all my friends that I still have in the, in the Corps, not many, but uh, we all basically feel the same way. Because we, 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 uh, we had five operations, that, uh, you know, one right after the other, that were just brutal. You know, each one got worse. And uh, all because of them. You know. So after your first operation, you went back to, 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 Maui. to Maui for some additional R&R &R yeah. training. Yeah, and then we went to Saipan, Saipan. and the Marianas. And my old division, the 3rd Division, they later took Guam, the uh, 3rd Marine Division, took Guam back, which was a United States territory. And that was, a, uh, Saipan didn't get the press that, uh, that uh, the Iwo got because of the tremendous loss of life in Iwo. But Saipan, they met us on the beach. I mean, we, we the, first, the first night we only had probably 80 to 100 yard beachhead. I mean, they counterattacked us and they, Two bonsai attacks at us, and they they weren't going to let us get a tow hole so we could bring in our heavier equipment and our, uh, our uh, artillery and all that. They, they, that was a tough battle. We had to fight every inch of the way in until we got really a foothold, which is wasn't easy. You know, we, we went. I can remember several times we went a yard at a time, and uh, it was it was a, a tough 28 day battle all the way to the very end. And then we had to dig them out of the caves, or one of the ones that were hiding in the caves. And uh, it, was, uh, it was some battle. Uh, Evo got all the press because of tremendous loss of life. And, uh, and Evo was an altogether different battle. You didn't see your enemy. You, know, uh, you had to dig them out of the ground. And Saipan, I saw them as close as we're sitting here together talking. I, I had them come through our lines. I had them charged with bayonets. I had, uh, you know, I had to kill them right up close. And in the Marine Corps, they teach you right off the bat: kill your enemy as quick as you can. Think about it later, because if you stop and think about it, you're dead. He's got you. So you 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 just kill them as quick as possible, and then think about it after you the battle's over and. It's, uh, and that's a good theory because anybody that thought of anything or dwelled on anything or thought of back home or flashed, flashes in your mind. And, see, the fortunate part of our war, World War II, if there's anything that can be fortunate about it, we were all single. My company commander was only 21 years old. We didn't have any married men. We didn't have anybody worried about their families and their children back home. like these young boys have today. Yeah, the boys today, they're married, little tots back home, and that's what I worry about. We didn't, we didn't give a goddamn after a while. After Saipan, I didn't give a shit if I got shot or not. You just, you know, this is, this is, this is getting old. You know, you just, you just fought until, well, you know, so what? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, they told us that 70% of us would get killed, so I hope I'm in the 30, but I'm not going to worry about it. And that, that's the attitude we had. We, we, you know, said we had to go on a patrol, we had to do this, but yeah, let's go, get this goddamn war, war over with. That was, a, that was the theory of the Marine Corps. And they always told us that if you, once we have an objective, like we have an objective, a, a, a dump, or an ammunition dump, or, 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 or any kind of a, a, a concentration of the enemy, a hill, or whatever it is, you get it. And you get it till the last two men are standing. And the last two men better be you and the enemy, and you better walk away the winner. There's no retreating, there's no holding back. We had, we, for instance, if we said we were going to get that house next door, there was a bluff. We went and got it, regardless. That's why we were criticized so much by the Army. 
I mean, it was a tremendous loss of life in the Marine Corps unnecessarily, but it's not true. Because we got it, got it over with and didn't drag it out for 20 days or 10 days or whatever. And I think in, in the history will prove the longer you delayed and laid back and everything, the more lives you lost. The enemy got stronger, they knew they were coming and so on and so forth. So that was the attitude we had. If we had objected, we went and got it. There was no, no ifs, ands, and buts about it. Get it at all costs. And then, in fact, in Iwo Jima, I bet you the last man in the Marine Corps would have been sent to Iwo Jima to get that island. Well, they had to come out of Washington, <laughs> they had to come out of Boston, all the soft, cushy jobs they had somewhere, they'd be over there because the Marine Corps would not back down. Mm. That's, that's why I, I, uh, I loved it so much. Yeah. You think this this feeling uh, evolved over your battles, or did you did you, did you go in your first, into your first battle with with with, the, with that mindset, or were you uh, initially no, the scared? First, and... The first one was Roy and the Moor. We were a bunch of cowboys. <laughs> we really didn't know. We didn't really know what we were getting into, <laughs> and uh, we it was a good indoctrination in uh, what what it was all about. After we got through it, we realized what it was all about. Yeah, our objectives were. Uh, the same as they taught us in Paris Island. And, and they filled you with history of the Marine Corps in Paris Island. And uh, told you all about, and don't let the Corps down. Don't let the Corps down. If you drop dead, fine. But don't drop dead and just it, it, it run in the other way. Don't let the Corps down. Remember the Marine Corps, the history of the Marine Corps, the Marines that went before you, what they accomplished, what they did, and uh, try to uh, try to do as good or better. In fact, when I was talking to the Commandant in Washington uh, the uh, 19th of uh, February this past year, he said that uh, the 4th Marine Division Marines and the Marines in Iwo Jima raised the, the standards of the Corps. Told me that personally. Yeah, he said that now the new standards are. Uh, in fact, he gave me a little insight into it. He said there was a major in uh, in, in uh, Baghdad with his with, with his Marines, and there were a lot of young Marines, first time in battle, and they were you know apprehensive, and uh, I can understand it. And he, the major said, "Look, don't worry, don't worry, fellow Marines." He said can't be as bad as he will. Mm. That's the way the core is. Yeah. 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 Well, after after a battle was over and you secured an area and and you were able to 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 rest and and decompress, I guess, if you will. What were your feelings into? Were you able to to sit back and, and just think what you went through? I mean, or did you, were you able to? Maintain that mindset. I mean, were you able well, to? We, we couldn't maintain a mindset. We're glad we're through because, see, uh, our general, General Howland Mad Smith, a wonderful general in the Marine Corps. Uh, we were supposed to, after Saipan, we were supposed to go from. I was in the assault waves five times, the assault troops, and he f always felt we did such a good job. Why change it? Why put somebody else in as assault troops? So we were always the assault troops. So we knew if whatever action was coming up, we'd be the assault troops again. Yeah, that was his way. <laughs> so after Saipan, we were supposed to be rotated to float and reserve. The 2nd Division and the 27th Army Division were supposed to take Tinian, which is right next door. And so we'd be in float and reserve. And if they had a terrible time of it, we'd, we'd get pulled into action. Again, but we, we, we deserve to be in reserve. Howland Mad Smith, re, uh, he was uh, very, very upset with the 27th Army on Saipan. They lagged behind. There's something else I could tell you I don't want to put on tape. And uh, he, he just uh, relieved their general, who happened to be Smith, General Smith of the 27th Army. He relieved him. And he told him, stay on Saipan and do guard duty. He said, my Marines will take Tinian. He said, give my Marines four days of hot food, 
clean their weapons, and we'll take Tinian. There we are again, where we saw troops on Tinian in four days, after a 28-day really tough battle. So you don't have time to think, oh, gee, that was a that was a terrible experience, and oh boy, am I glad that's over. Let's let's sit here and enjoy this nice hot coffee. <laughs> no way. You you just well, that's like you. You go to the office, you do your job, you come home, you forget about that one, and then you go back to the office the next day. It's the same same basic mindset. We never knew we were out of it till we board ship heading back towards towards Maui. You never know when they say, well, we're diverted to another island because MacArthur needs help here or something. So we went and took Tinian. And uh, we took Tinian in 11 days and uh, just stormed Tinian, went in the back way, outsmarted them, and uh, went in over cliffs. There was a, we only had a 75-yard beachhead at Tinian. Tinian Town was one of the prettiest beaches you'd ever see in the Pacific or in the, in, in, uh, anywhere in the Caribbean. And they had all their guns lined up at Tinian Town towards those beautiful beaches because they knew if they were ever invaded, they'd have to be invaded that way. So our generals and our planners, who uh, I could kiss them today, they, uh, they put a feint in. They took a group of, of marines and amphibious tractors and ships and everything and made believe they, were, they knew they were going to be invaded made believe they were going to land at Tinian Town. Well, my outfit, the 4th Division, we went in around the back with, with scaling hooks and, and going over water, uh, cliffs. There was only 75 yards that was open. And uh, we got the whole dam of uh, first of the salts and, and everything in that 75 yards. And they they were they were all waiting for they were all waiting for the attack on Tinny and Town. We got in, got a beautiful, got a beautiful uh, beachhead, so to speak. It wasn't a beachhead, there wasn't a beach there, but we got in far enough to be entrenched, to get our equipment up, get everything set. And then when they finally realized they were suckered, we and they opened up on us. All they had basically were machine guns and mortars and and things like that to fight us. They didn't have that heavy beach artillery and coastal artillery to shoot at us. So um, we, we, we outfoxed them, and that, that took 11 days. Then they finally said, uh, well, fellows, you did a good job, but we're going back to do some more training as Okinawa's coming up. <laughs> so uh, back to Maui we, uh, we all went. And, uh, but we, what we never knew about Iwo Jima it was always we were told Okinawa, because that was a big, huge, uh, uh, holding of the Japanese. And then in their, their final planning, they decided that uh, Iwo Jima was much more important as a first first step because they had a lot of fighter planes there. And when our big bombers went over to Japan, to, and, and they were harassed by the fighter pilots, and they couldn't have fighter escorts because they were too far away. So they said, uh, Iwo Jima, they've got to take Iwo Jima. So guess who? <laughs> yeah, so. Talk about uh, about physical conditions a little bit as uh, as an assault marine, as far as you know, lack of sleep. What 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 did you eat? Did you get enough to eat? Uh, oh, the yeah, humidity, well, the heat. Uh, well, talk well, about. We were, well, every island was different because you're moving up the Pacific uh, on on uh, on Roy in the moor. We had everything right with us there, you know, we, we were, there we went over the side of the, the troop ships. And uh, so we had a great food all the way over, great food. They give you a steak and eggs the day of the invasion. Get you up about three in the morning and they give you a nice, thick, well, as many steaks as you can hold. Nice steak and egg breakfast and, and coffee and juice and you got a full belly when you land. And then uh, when, you, when you're on the island, we weren't on those islands too long, you have your K rations and C rations, and as soon as you secure an area, you're, you, you have your, your uh, child people come right in, set up hot, 
pot chow and, and uh, your cooks and bakers and uh, your uh, mess hall people, they, they're right behind you, you know, they, they come in so you're well taken care of with food, water. But on Saipan, it was different, I think I explained to you, we didn't have much of a, a beachhead, so they couldn't get in. So you depended on chocolate, blocks of chocolate, the canteen water that you could, any, it had to depend on what you were carrying at the time. And the most important thing to carry was ammunition. So uh, as you fought your way in to the battle and established uh, uh, an area where your know, mess people could come in and set up kitchens and, and uh, but we never saw it. They took care of the beach people. We, we, uh, we never saw hot food, combat troops, never, they never caught up to us. Uh, logistics, I guess, they just couldn't uh, bring the things up closer, so you, you, they would bring up K rations and C rations and things like that that they could carry easily. And uh, like your quartermaster people, would, that was their job to keep your supply and water, ammunition, and, and carrot and food you could carry. And that was usually a, a block of, uh, of uh, food. You ripped it open, and you, if you had a chance, you could heat up a bullion cube or uh, uh, Borden's instant coffee or something like that. So you didn't really get. Uh, you got something had to be nutritious, but it wasn't belly filling. I'll tell you. Uh, and you, oh, I went 57 days with the same set of underwear, socks, leggings, underwear, all through Saipan today. And we didn't even get a chance to get down and bathe after Saipan. We just cleaning our equipment, getting uh, more ammunition and everything before we went to Tinian. Uh, and no, uh, but. That, that was basically the, the assault troops. Because they, they, you know, we were, we were moving. We were just trying to get as much real estate for Uncle Sam as we could. So you could bring in your tanks, bring in your uh, half tracks, and bring in your soup kitchens. Or, and, uh, and so they were taking care of the beach people. There's hundreds. See, there's, for every combat marine, there's seven uh, Marines behind them in some capacity. It takes seven, seven to keep a, one combat Marine in, in action. So there, there's all the, the logistics of it all. So, but you know, I can't ever remember being hungry. You're just, you're adrenaline, your whole system, uh, your, your survival mechanism. Tired, yeah, we'd, we'd be exhausted. I. I, I slept through, uh, they said, I slept through a pretty good sized uh, bonsai attack one night. Slept right through the whole damn thing. Mm. And all hell was broken loose, but you were just mentally fatigued, you know, just gone. Because we, when we set up at night, it was two hours on, two hours off, two hours on, two hours off. You just get to sleep and the two hours was up. But you had to, you had to give everybody a little bit of something to, to rejuvenate them. And, uh, because that was another thing. At night, that's when the Japanese counterattacked. Most of their counterattack, bonsai attacks, came at night. And they tried to harass you at night when you, they knew you were pooped. They were laying back uh, in caves and wherever, and uh, you were plowing through the cane fields and the jungles and the, and the cliffs and uh, what have you, carrying all this heavy equipment to, to uh, fight. So uh, that's a good question. I, 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 could, I could never remember being hungry. Or, mm. I remember being tired, but never being hungry. You, you just moved on without thinking about it. Well, you know, I, I just think, you know, you just look at the conditions of, you know, wearing the same underwear for 57 days and not eating properly. And, and I think that would be stressful on ordinary life, not to mention being in, in combat. See, they gave us so many shots before we went into combat, and we took so many pills. Every time we took water, we had a bunch of pills we had to take. And we would sleep in, in uh, you, you know, you've heard of foxholes? Well, we dug a little depression in the ground. Who the hell was going to dig with a little teeny shovel, dig something that you could get into up to your neck, you know? You dig, dug a little depression so 
you know, just just below the ground, and it was wet, and it would rain, and and uh, you'd be, you know, uh, a guan or sleeping next to you or something, and for warmth, and uh, we figured, Jesus, there's, there's no disease in the world we could possibly get when we get out if we ever get out of this mess, because they, whatever it was, whether either the shots or the arms. We had you walk through a line of boom, 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 boom before we left for an operation. And yeah, I never gave it much thought, but uh, you never, I never caught a cold. <laughs> and you never had any of the things that you, you walk down the street and grab a handrail and you get today. I, I don't know what the hell it was, but mm. it was now that I never gave it any thought till you brought it up, but never can remember being hungry, never can remember having a cold. Never can remember having a, you know, any a stomach ache. Or, I guess your your body took over and your mind took over and you know, changed your whole system. I guess. Well, you know, I look at uh, when I look at uh, footage or newsreels and I, and I see you guys marching in the, in the battle with all this equipment on and all this uh, all the all this clothing, but it was it wasn't it very hot and humid. And I mean, how did you deal with that? With we dealt with it this way. When we landed on the beach, every beach I can remember landing on, and we kept our ammunition in our water and we threw everything else away. We threw our gas masks away. We threw. We had. We were loaded down like pack rats. Kept, <laughs> kept our water, our ammunition, and what you know that little K mark, the K food again. And maybe uh, 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 underneath our, uh, our uh, ammunition belt, our poncho. So we could put a poncho over us in the jungle rains. That was it. What the hell? We didn't need any shaving gear. We, we, we didn't need any soap. Uh, I, I landed with green underwear, and when I took it off, it was white. Yeah, the salt just took all the dye right out of the underwear. Uh, you didn't need that stuff, but they give it to you. I, uh, we didn't carry it. We couldn't. I don't know if the people behind us carried it, but we sure as hell didn't carry it. Uh, canteen on each side, ammunition, hand grenades all over us. You know, and uh, in my particular case, I had a machine gun, tripod, my my ammunition carriers had boxes of ammunition and water. That was all we needed. Couldn't be logged down with that stuff. Yeah, it blows my mind when I see that now, those poor devils running through 105 degree heat with all that crap on. I don't know how they do it. But this skinny kid couldn't do it, I'll tell you. But none of us did. We didn't we did we didn't bother with that. Looks good in the movies, but we we couldn't mess with that. So as an assault uh, assault marine, was there at some point where Somebody behind took over, or, or did you always? Yeah, what well, we did. Well, when you say you well, see, I was in the assault wave. That's the first wave. So you got your second wave and your third wave behind you. Well, you might have, like I was in the second battalion, so I was in the assault wave. But the third battalion was right behind it. So as we moved up and and, and, and gained real estate, they would move through you and give you a break. Uh, but not during the assault. The assault, the assault way is supposed to grab as much real estate as possible. And then as things get done, and uh, you know, if I would say I was in a murderous, a real murderous field of fire for two or three days, and we just, it was just unbelievable. And the third battalion uh, behind us, you know, they were, they were catching fire, but they weren't in that murderous uh, circumstances. We would, Stay out. We never. There's no such thing as falling back for equal. We'd hold our position. The third battalion would say would move through us, and they would take over the assault for X number of days or whatever it had to be. And then uh, that's the way that. Th and then we were basically not refreshed, but we weren't getting crap kicked out of us. Uh, and then they would hold position, not fall back. Hold position. And we'd move through them, so and that's the, way, that's the way you did it. Now, like for instance, there'd be certain. Remember, I can clearly remember on, on Saipan in particular, there'd be there'd be areas that were really tough to get through. 
And uh, so you, you do the best you could. You took a lot of casualties and, and everything. So then that's when you, you, they would move up and take your position. And there was one place in particular, it was a tank encampment, Japanese tank encampment. And it was a, it was a, a hill, going up quite a hill. And uh, we had to get up on top of that hill and, and they, 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 to try to go around it and reach where the tanks came out and went around, they had their tanks set up and they just blasted those tanks. So you just you couldn't get up. What we had to do is get up over there, get our bazookas, like over the knoll. See, here's the hill. And get, get over the, get our bazookas. You can't fire that way, it just goes off in the air. Got to get the bazookas up over there. Got to get the machine guns up and over. Got to get the flamethrowers up over there. And that, the assault has to do that. So we got up there, and we got up as high as we could, and they had the, they had the tree line cut down like that from their fire, trying to keep us away from the area. And, and then that's when I said, we, I remember moving up a yard at a time. So uh, catching my sergeant, platoon sergeant, he would look down the line, and we, had, we just couldn't stay there for the day. <laughs> and his, say to me, okay, killer, move up. That meant my squad would have to move up. And I'd look at him as much as say, you're crazy as a pet, but go to hell with my mind. But I knew my job. I moved up. Then my number one gunner saw me move up a yard, maybe a foot, and he'd move up. Because they're firing over our heads like mad. And they were trying to lob shells in with artillery shells and everything over our heads and drop them down, and a few of those would run shot. And so my number one gunner would see me move up. Remember the Corps, he'd move up. Number two gunner see the number one gunner move up, he'd move up. The ammunition carrier move. And all the way down the line from that one guy, that old line would move up a foot at a time. We'd get everybody on line, catch him and say, let's go again. And we get up there and we just got our bazookas over there, got my machine guns over there, water cools, air cools, and we fired down on them. And, and got flamethrowers and bazookas and we, we kept them in their tanks and then we, uh, uh, we, 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 we just cleaned out the whole mess. Just, and, and then our people were able to go around and throw heavy, heavy stuff in there and, and blow, them, blow them to hell. But we couldn't get enough safe rounds up and over. And we had one or two fall shot, you lose 10, 12 men on shot rounds. So it had to be a, a, a dig them out yourself. Mm. And that, that was just the way it was. Mm. Yeah. Well, what was it like to, in, in battle to see friends and, and fellow Marines injured and killed around you? I mean. Well, uh, that uh, when you land, like I say, there's a lot of casualties the first way, a lot of casualties. You see them, you follow Marines floating in the water, and uh, or arm blown off, or leg blown off, or head blown off, or blown to smithereens. Uh, it goes back to the first thing I told you. In the Marine Corps, you look down, you see them, you don't think about it. You don't think about it. The only thing thought that was, I um, can't speak for everybody, but the only thing you thought you can think of is uh, better him than me. And you move on. And because ne the next second it, you could be there. So you, you just move on. And then after you get, so you can uh, cry about it or mourn about it or think about it, that's when you think about it. Like where I told you, face your enemy, kill him as quick as you can, think about it later, see your dead buddies, don't think about it, move on, think about it later. It's all you can do. Uh, if you stop and, 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 and mourn them or cry about your best buddy getting killed, you'd be lying right side of him. Uh, he was there in that spot, he got it, you stay in that spot. But, now if you got, if you were there, wounded, just wounded, but you can tell if they're dead, like they're floating in the water, and 
or on the sand, and you could you could tell the dead on it. Then you then that's a different story. You do everything humanly possible to bring them to shelter, drag them, pick them up if you can, but you usually can't, but drag them to safety. And then holler for Corman, the greatest people in the world. The Corman will come and uh, administer first aid, and try to save their lives, but uh, it's, uh, it's basic human nature, survival of the fittest, better him than me. But uh, afterwards you don't feel that way, you just feel bad, you feel, uh, well, this is what they told us would happen. So they indoctrinate you good in the core to things like that. And uh, we didn't really get into, get with people that were, in the later part of the Pacific War, they were taking them out of the prisons. If you were in prison for 20 years for some something you did, Marine Corps, they'd come to you and they'd say, well look, we need, we need men, we need Marines over in the Pacific. You give you a complete pardon, you join the Fleet Marine Force. So you'd say, yeah, oh, great. So you take the complete pardon, you only in, say you only served five years of a 20 year sentence. So you take the you take the pardon and you get over there. But they were no good. They were bawdy. They hadn't been they hadn't had the training. They'd been out of the out of the loop for five years. Uh, they just thought of you know, then we started getting married men and uh, they, they would think of their wives or back home. But they were no good. You cannot think of anything but what is immediately going on. And they were the first ones to get killed. Get, uh, they, uh, they, you know, some would get up and run when they shouldn't have, when they should have been digging in with their toenails and their fingernails. <laughs> they get up and ran, they get cut in half. Uh, uh, oh, the hell with this, I'd rather be in prison. <laughs> and, but they, they, uh, it was the boys that went through boot camp recently. And, and, and indoctrinated into the Marine Corps that were the best. And that's what you attribute, you think your survival to was that, that train of thought? Oh, it's the mindset, yeah. absolutely yeah. the mindset yeah. that they, they give you. Uh, you know, uh, well, well, I met, uh, Marilyn wrote me a letter, said her brother was on the D-305 in the, in, the, uh, in the Pacific. I said, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you know, it's only about 6,000 boats in the Pacific, so, uh, <laughs> Anyway, I woke up one morning on the LST. I always, we traveled on LSTs. We were seven, seven days ahead of the convoy because we, nobody would bother us. We didn't draw enough water. And we had guns if a plane attacked us. And uh, so consequently, uh, but I did see him and, uh, and went aboard his ship and uh, to talk to the officers. They didn't even know where they were going or anything. But I told him, I, I gave him my watch, I gave him a ring, I gave him some personal things. I said, you know, give him to Maryland when you get home. Because I, I don't know if I'll make it or not. I said, to him, this is going to be the fifth one. But I said, I haven't got a scratch on me. I'm not even a mosquito bite, <laughs> I remember. And uh, so I said, you figure, you know, how long can this last? How many can you go through? Like, uh, we had a, one of our great heroes, Sergeant uh, Stone. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor, and his, the rest of his duty was going to be selling war bonds in, the, in this country. He sold a few war bonds and wanted to go back into action. He did get killed in the evil. So, uh, it's, I don't know, it's just one of those, one of those things. <laughs> Had you ever looked back, uh, say, in a, in a downtime or after the war, or even now, how in such a short period of time you went from this easygoing, self-proclaimed playboy to the conditions you were in. I mean, in a, in a very compressed amount of time, short period of time, you went from almost really two extremes of life. Oh, we all did. Yeah. Every boy that went in the Corps, uh, all, we all did. Uh, you know, we're all young boys uh, uh, out of high school, out a year maybe, or, uh, just uh, starting their first job, or planning on going to college. We, that, that happened to every young man, whether you went in the Navy, the Army, Coast Guard, it's a young man's war, and, uh, and it was. So, yeah, it was just, it was a condition that uh, you adapted to very quickly. 
In, in fact, in, in my particular case in the Marine Corps, we didn't have draftees. We were all enlisted in the Marine Corps until the very end when we needed men desperately. Uh, it was a, a volunteer uh, uh, outfit, and you, uh, well, Marilyn will tell you, we have a convention where we did. Couldn't believe we all sang out of the same hymnal. We all had the same philosophy of life and, 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 and everything. And, uh, she said, you, you listen to one of you, you might as well listen to all of you. you know? <laughs> uh, yeah, we were all put in that same pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. I don't care. My opinion always was this, that if one person is shooting at you, it's a big war. And if you're on a ship that's being attacked, it's a big war. If you're, no matter where you are in the military, you're doing the very best you can do, and you're doing what you were told. And uh, so nobody was any better than anybody else, in my opinion, in World War II. If they served in the armed services, they, they were sent where they were sent, they did what they were told, and they did their job. And uh, that was the way I looked at it. I, I, I volunteered to go to the Marine Corps. That was my choice. I do the, did the best I could to be there, and uh, that's basically it. I, mean, it's, I don't know how the young boys. I, when I went aboard that aircraft carrier uh, in, in last year, and uh, I just congratulated every every enlisted man and every officer I met on board that ship. And they were trying to congratulate us. They were trying to honor us, but I congratulated them for the job they're doing. Uh, that's, that's the way I think this thing ought to come down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you keep? Uh, how was it like keeping in touch with uh, St. Marilyn at home or your 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 parents? Was well, that, we uh, we had uh, what they call victory letters, little little compressed uh, notes. Couldn't write much of a letter, and uh, I I sent one to Marilyn, six other girls. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just change the names up the top, and uh, then I, uh, of course, sent to my my mother and father, but very rarely, uh, just enough to know that uh, I was still alive. And uh, I never even I never notified them when I got wounded. Uh, I was in the hospital in Guam when they evacuated me from Iwo. And uh, my cousin happened to be there, he was in the Seabees. And he would look over the, the list of everybody that was evacuated off the hospital ship coming into Guam and uh, looking for friends. And, and he saw my name and he came to visit me in the hospital. And I told him, I said, I left him, don't write home to my mother and, and, and tell him I'm in here. Just let, it's been a long time, they think I'm doing fine. And then, and uh, so I said, let it, let, it, let it be. He went and wrote home and told that uh, he, and, uh, he saw me in the hospital. I, I don't know, I can't remember what, what he said, but I don't know. But my mother, and, Mal? What? Did, did uh, my mother get notified by the Navy Department or left his letter first? Pardon? Who got, what did my mother get first, a letter from Lefty? Or, or the or the war department that I was wounded. She's really from your cousin. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if she yeah. ever did from the war department or not. Oh yeah, she did. They all have to, they have to do that. Yeah. So my cousin wrote home. Uh, <laughs> but um, did did your did your mom or your dad ever express after the war if you after you sat down what they were feeling while you were gone? Was there well, a know, lot of concern? We got back. We got back uh, in my case. Uh, I forgot about the war. Well, I got, I got out the seventh, got married the ninth. You know, I didn't even have time to think about getting married, let alone uh, uh, the war. No, we just, basically, all of us guys just forgot about it. Just forgot about it. I, my mother never asked me, was it bad, Karen? Or was it terrible? Or was it this? Or was it that? Because she probably knew I wouldn't tell her anyway. And I think that's the way most. They were just so happy to see you home. And that was it. the wall was coming to a close, and uh, let's get on with life. That's the way I read it, anyway. Yeah. 
In fact, my kids never knew anything. I was even in the Marine Corps. And my son wanted to rent a uniform. He was in a play at the high school. And I said, what do you want to rent a uniform? Oh, I got to be dressed as a, as a serviceman. I said, oh, I got my uniform. You can wear that. And that's when they found out I was in the Marine Corps. We didn't, I didn't correspond with anybody. Uh, I didn't join anything. I didn't join the American Legion. I didn't join the Foreign Wars. I didn't join the Marine Corps League. I just, I wanted to block it out, start a new life, raise a family. Couldn't wait to get married and have children and, you know, go on with life. And I think the poor guys that did dwell on it were the guys that drank a lot, had, uh, uh, you know, a bad feeling about it. And uh, personally, I just tried to, eh, that happened, so let's forget it. And it wasn't until later years when I uh, started getting a letter from, a, from nobody and, and gee, we ought, we should, we should get together and, you know, talk about uh, the days in the core and have a little reunion. And, and the older you get, the more uh, you talk about it, the more it comes back to you. Because you've just gone through another period in life that, uh, you know, one of those, one of those things. Can we, can we go uh, back up to, to the, the battle in Iro and talk about the battle and, and your, your injury and how you got wounded? And, and well, I, uh, as I say, I was in the assault wave again. And uh, we were told that Iwo was a very small island. We studied it. We knew its potential was only 600 miles off of Japan's mainland. And that they would probably fiercely defend it and uh, just uh, go in and knock the crap out of them, <laughs> basically. And then uh, it was kind of a rude awakening to the, uh, the, uh, the, the soil, like the toys, like, like, uh, like uh, nothing you ever saw in your life. Jet black, smelled terrible. It was sulfur, it was a sulfur island. And, uh, very hard to get your footing. You couldn't get your footing in. They, they, uh, they shelled it. They had a very, very, uh, very nice system for as far as they was concerned. Horrible for us. But uh, they had picture a checkerboard the way it seems to mine. The black spaces and the red spaces are a checkerboard. Well, with their artillery and their, their naval guns, shore battery guns from the mountainous areas and the high ground. They had zeroed out this pattern on the shore. So they would start firing down the down the island. They let they let you they let us get on get on the beach without any you know, it was so unusual because every other beach they met us on the beach. They didn't meet us on the beach this time. They started firing down when we got on the beach firing from where we were down to the water on the black squares. Then they would come back the red squares. So if you were lucky enough to be in the red squares on the way down and the black squares on the way back and vice versa, you survived. If you weren't, of course nobody knew the way the grids were laid out, and they just covered it like a blanket down with a heavy fire and back with a heavy fire. Down with a heavy fire and back with a heavy fire. And then they messed it up. Then they had flying ash cans that they catapulted through the air, 50 gallon drums full of all kinds of metal, uh, ball bearings, sharp pieces of metal, uh, it was anti personnel. And you could see them going in or in over your head. And then uh, when they get so many feet uh, off the ground, they'd detonate them and they'd explode and they'd send down this, uh, this shower of shrapnel and everything. It was just, it was, a, it was as close to hell as you ever want to get. And, uh, but there I say, you just couldn't turn around and go back to the ship. Well, you had your objectives and our, my objectives uh, in my outfit was the, was the airport, the first airport. And uh, so we just fought our way up 
just no one would not know what we were shooting at because uh, we would if we'd see a blast in the in, in, in up ahead of us or a machine gun fire or something you could detect detect it you'd fire at it but you didn't see anybody it was just just like a robot island no no human beings but uh, a lot of a lot of fire coming at you so uh, I got up to the uh, my objective and uh, was the, was the airport, and then all of a sudden a huge uh, shell came in, and I had nine men in my squad. I lost, uh, I lost five of them. Uh, well, I've lost seven of them, blown to bits. Just arms and legs. <clears throat> I was lying in that, in that stuff on my left side, uh, and. Uh, Practically my whole left side leg was covered in that stuff. You put your elbow in, it'd sink way down. And my right side was exposed. So I caught the shrapnel all, all up my whole right side. Uh, From that shell that hit the... Yeah, one shell uh -huh. uh, it, it hit us. And uh, then Bowers, my uh, my first uh, gunner, he was on he was on his right side in, 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 in this hole, and naturally he got hit on the left side. All the rest of them were just, like I said, the, the other seven were just, you couldn't recognize them. They, they took the blunt of it. They, 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 were, they took the whole shot, really. We just got the side fragments blast. And uh, then, uh, well, well, five hours later, Corman came in, looked over the ledge, and said, oh, you guys need some help? And I said, yeah. So he came in, and I had done the best I could to bear We carried that, remember I said that belt? In, the, in that belt is a pack of, of sulfur manilamite and bandages and I don't know what the hell else. And I, I took my K-bar knife and I cut my leggings and my pants up and of course, I was all blood all over, so I looked to see where the biggest wound was. It was on my lower leg, and I poured sulfur manilamide on that, and I just and Bowers did the same. And, uh, we just sat there, and we couldn't move. We were both incapacitated, and just talked. In a lot of pain. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, that's the least of your worries. <laughs> yeah. Pain, you can, you can dismiss the pain, and uh, you just wonder when the next one's coming in, you're going to be gone. Uh, so about five hours later, a Corbin came in, and he worked on both of us, did a better job than we did, actually. Then he gave us a shot of morphine and a bottle of brandy, and uh, he said, uh, I'll notify the litter bearers. Now, in the Marine Corps, the band, there's a little bit of us in action. Uh, every every division and, and regiment has a band, and their function is during peacetime, play music, marches, drill field, and but in in in, in battle they're the, they're the they're the little bit of us. And he wrote a card on me, you know, first aid minister such and such a dollar, uh, brandy and morphine. And he did the same for Bowers. And he said, I'll notify any litter bearers that I went in on. So off he went. So Ted Ketcher, my sergeant, we, had, we, we were ready to move up again. And he said, OK, Kilway, let's go. He said, we're moving up. And I can't tell you what I told him. But I said, uh, no way, I'm not moving an inch. So he got a little closer over the hole, and he said, "You either move or I'll shoot you right there. And I said, you crazy bastard, kid, take a better look. And he got over, over the shell hole better, and he could see what was going on. And he said, oh, okay, see you later. <laughs> and off he went. And uh, then uh, the little bearers came, I don't know what time, but they came and they got bowers. And I was senior man, so I told him to take him first. I never saw him again. I understand he died of fright, probably because of uh, the 
what happened on the way to the beach. Uh, when they laid down a barrage, the little bears, they, they had to save their own lives. You were already half shot, so why? So they all, four of them, they would die for cover when the barrages started in. <clears throat> and they would die for cover to save their lives, which is normal. And you're laying up there. <laughs> Pretty good fortune I going on, you know, and uh, then they pick you up again and they uh, get you down to the shore. And then, uh, but they were constantly beating up the equipment on the shore. I don't know if you see any pictures of evil, with all the stuff, the tanks, the boats, and everything. They were, they were as they went back and forth with this heavy stuff. So anyway, they got me back. Uh, they got me on a hospital ship, and I stayed there. And then I uh, was evacuated to Guam. Then from Guam, I was evacuated to uh, uh, Honolulu. And from Honolulu, I was taken to back to San Francisco. And then from San Francisco back to Chelsea Naval Hospital. I spent about six months before I got home. Mm. Yeah. Six months recovery time. Hmm? Six months to recover? Yeah. Yeah. And like I say, I will get out of one war and into another. Out the seventh, married the ninth. <laughs> the seventh of September. September. Yeah. So the war had, been, had gotten over the, that and August. Europe was a little while I was recuperating, yeah. but uh, the battle in, uh, in the Pacific wasn't over yet. Yeah. But of course, on the back of my discharge, which was uh, very pleasant to read, it says not fit for any further military duty. Because once you're in the Marine Corps, you're in any branch of the service, you're subject to call for 10 years. So no matter what, they couldn't have called me. Like for Korea, they couldn't have called me for Korea. Do you remember what you were thinking when you heard uh, that we dropped the A-bomb? Uh, I, uh... I could have kissed Harry Truman's ass in Times Square and given him an hour to draw a crowd. That's the way I felt about it. That saved millions of lives on both sides. Yeah, that was a very courageous thing to do because I don't know what you, know, what you are, an independent, Republican, or a Democrat, but this country of isolationists have been, ever since George Washington, they're isolationists. If we stick our head in the sand, this bad stuff will go away. And it won't. You gotta fight for every stinking freedom we have. And that uh, this country is still isolationist. And they were then when, when we had to go into World War II. They were isolation in World War I. They were George Washington back in his day said, stay out of foreign affairs. But the world is shrinking. We have we can't stay out of foreign affairs. We gotta fight for our survival. And the only way you can fight for your, for your survival is not with a bunch of mealy mouth Democrats or Republicans in the, in the, in the Congress and the Senate. Oh, we don't want to do that. We might offend somebody. They might not like us. They hate us. We know they hate us. So why the hell all this mealy mouth? I don't know. I just don't understand. But it's, it's been our tradition since way back, as far as I can remember in history, that... Uh, we're isolationists. You can't be. You've got to have a strong military. You've got to have a military that you give them the goal. It's your ball game now. We're going to sit in the booth here. It's your ball game. You do it. If you do it right, wonderful. If you do it wrong, well, you did the best you can. But no, you got all these damn fools wanting to close this down, wanting to do that. Well, it just makes me sick. That's where I get upset. I don't get upset at, uh, at anything that happened to me or anything in the war. I, I get up upset what's happening today. I, I read the paper, I could rip it up and, and, and throw it out the window. You know, always looking for something to pick this country apart. Uh, our own people. Bad enough, the enemy's looking for something to, way to pick us apart. But I, I, our own people up there, I don't care who they are. But that's, that's just my opinion. Yeah. I get a lot of arguments. <laughs>
Well, as we get towards the tail end of this interview, is there any uh, anything that we left out that you wanted to talk about? Uh, any stories, uh, any comments you wanted to make uh, as we close out? Uh, any closing thoughts that you want to pass on to, to, to present and future generations that will watch this tape? Well, uh, yes. I, the, the, I don't like to talk about, you know, uh, the combat that I've seen or the combat that I've participated in. Uh, I think there's been enough written about that, about the combat, of all of uh, the battles that I happen to participate in, so there's no sense talking about it. It's kind of redundant to talk about it. But I, I, would, like to, I would like to tell the future generations that fight for the right of this country. There's no other country in the world going to look out for us but ourselves. I don't care if they were our allies during some of our wars. They could be very easily enemies in our future wars. Fight for this country and fight hard. Don't be afraid to give up your life, because your life is not worth a plug nickel if somebody else is running it for you. If you're speaking Japanese or you're speaking uh, Arabic or you're speaking any other language of the people of the world that hate us, Fight and fight hard, and don't run to Canada when they have a draft. Get on a uniform and fight for your rights. That's my opinion. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time today, well, I, sir. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I just hope that somewhere along the line our teachers in the high schools teach what uh, people like myself and people that weren't before me have, have given up. To, uh, for this country. Uh, I, I felt it was, and I still do, an unbelievable honor to have served. And all my friends, at, uh, at some of them, well, we only had 17% of our outfit left. But each one of us would do it again. Thank you very much for your service. This is 60 years later. Yeah. What? That's the problem. It affected. Uh, well, they had no support in that war. Another case of a Senate and Congress isolationists. They want everybody to love them. And politicians. I was invited to a reception for 101 Iwo Jima survivors in Washington, D.C. for the February 19th uh, anniversary, 60th anniversary of Iwo Jima. I was fortunate enough to uh, meet and have a nice conversation with the Commandant of the Marine Corps who said that the Marines of uh, Iwo Jima have raised the standards of the Marine Corps around the world. And I was very appreciative of that statement. 